Okay, dads, let's go ahead and get started, guys. Now, some of you have already let me know how uncomfortable you were in last week's meeting. So tonight, we're going to try to respect each other's boundaries. What? Tonight, we've also got a guest with us, David. And would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hey, guys. I'm David. David. Hey, David. Hey, how many kids do you have, David? None. At least, not at the moment. Uh, my wife is pregnant, and uh, she should be delivering any day now. Mm, that's great. So Super. Oh, great. Awesome. Who would like to go first? Anyone. Anyone. I'll go. Perfect. Todd? Yes. My daughter and I went to the mall, and she said she wanted to take the stairs to the second level. And I said, I don't trust stairs, because they're always up to something. <laughs> Todd, I'm sorry that happened. Okay. Yeah. I encourage you to try to resist the urge to make jokes like that. Yeah. My turn? Okay. Can I go? Okay. Yesterday, actually, my daughter got home and she asked me how my day was. And I said, well, a guy tried to sell me a coffin, but that's the last thing I need. Oh, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. that joke is dead on arrival. Because it's the last thing I need. David, <laughs> how about you? Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't say This is a safe zone. Just jump on in. Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I'm just scared of being a dad. I'm afraid I'm gonna start telling bad jokes just like my dad. Well, it might be in our nature. We can fight against it. Hey, speaking of nature, I tried to catch some fog yesterday. I missed. <laughs> M-I-S-T. Oh, yeah. You're a monster. I, this is where the boundary is. I'm done. This is where you are. Hello? Really? Okay, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I'll be right there. That was Julie. Her water just broke. I guess the baby finally ran out of womb. <laughs> I'm gonna be a dad. Don't you think it should be going? Oh, yeah. So I told my wife she drew her eyebrows too high. She seemed surprised. Good morning, church, friends, family. Hope you all are doing good this morning. It's a beautiful morning. Happy Father's Day. I am here sitting on the new steps at the church. We poured some new concrete this week. They've been working on it all week. Gives a little bit more area and uh, sloped in some areas to make it a little bit more uh, friendly for uh, uh, handicap situations, wheelchairs, what have you. So uh, definitely blessed by that. Uh, just wanted to say again, happy Father's Day. Dads, we need you. We need you bad. Um, we need you to, to show your kids, both your sons and your daughters, how to grow up and be godly men and women, uh, and how to treat their mothers, no matter what your family situation looks like. Uh, dads, you're, you're working hard, you're doing the best you can, and you're doing a great job. Uh, so thank you so much for everything you're doing. Um, and uh, we're definitely blessed to have you guys here at PAX NAS. So they were tearing this up this last week and we couldn't really get most of our stuff in for the uh, worship team. So we met at Matt's garage and we did some garage band worship in, uh, in honor of Father's Day. So here it is, we hope you enjoy it. Sit back, relax, worship God. And uh, again, happy Father's Day. Good. 
that, I'm just gonna say it. I don't know why it's hard for me to talk real with you, but it is. And all we ever do is talk weather and sports and sports and weather, and that's it. I don't know. What I really wanna say is I'm thankful for how you loved me growing up, and you always made time for me, and I love you. Happy Father's Day. That was really good. You think? Yeah, you need to tighten it up a little bit, but other than that, you're ready. Okay, thanks Uncle Ron. Here goes. Good. Dad. Son. <sighs> Looks like the uh, clouds are rolling in. Yeah, hope they don't postpone the game tonight. Listen, Dad, I wanted to, I wanted to say something to you. Okay. Just, I just want to thank of you for, well, thank you for being, you know, a, a dad. Not, not just a dad, you know, being, for being one that's mine and not, well, of course not just mine. You're Jessica and Jordan's dad too, but it's, it's cool. Matthew. I, I, yes, sir. I know. Dad, I, I don't think you do know. No, oh, no, I know. I heard you talking, Uncle Ron. I was sitting just four feet from you. Well, I meant it. Thank you. Good morning, Pax Naz. Thanks for joining us online this morning. We're grateful to gather together in worship and continue to do so in the next couple of weeks. And we want to remind you, if you um, didn't know or haven't heard the communication, that uh, July the 19th will be Homecoming Sunday here at Paxton Church of the Nazarene. Looking forward to being together on site. We'll have everything in place that we're able to do to be social distanced and all those kinds of things. So just a few more weeks and we look forward to that day. I have an ask for our congregation that is on, that would be on site that's here in the area. Recently I sent to each family that we had an address for uh, information, a survey, information that I'd love to have to be able to communicate even better with you. I want to encourage you this week to take time to fill that out if you haven't done so already and send that in so we can get our records and information all ready to go as we come back together. So it is Father's Day, and uh, we're celebrating Father's Day today. We're thankful for our fathers and what they mean to us and how they have spoken into our lives. And so today I would like to say a happy Father's Day to my dad, to Dave Gerstenberger, and um, wish you a happy day. And then also I'd like to bring greetings to my son, Jordan, it's his very first Father's Day, and so we're excited about uh, that new role for his life. And as I think about fathers, and we're going to look at our message today, um, a father's love is our topic as we celebrate together. Um, I can still think back to my very first Father's Day, which seems like yesterday, how fast time goes by. And so each year as we've celebrated fathers on this day in June, again, we're going to do so today with a great message about a loving father. So as I think about these things and I, as I think about how I wanna kind of process today our message, um, I wanna talk about how, and I've talked about this before, how blessed I was with a spiritual heritage from family, parents, grandparents, and then far back as I can remember. Not everyone has that, but on a day like today, I want to kind of go forward for wherever we are as families and as fathers and as families, raising our families in Christ and in the church. So I want to share with you just a little bit about the background, things I remember that was a part of my spiritual heritage. I think about Sundays, how we would go to Sunday school and we would go to children's church. 
And then we had our scouting program on Wednesday nights called Caravans. I love to be in those settings and to learn and to, to be a part of all that was happening, the vacation Bible schools and all the things that were a part of that time in my life. I was blessed enough that I knew enough about God that when I was 12 years of age, I accepted Christ for the first time into my life at a youth camp. And that has changed my life from then on to this point. I think about those things and I think about the memories and, and I, I remember at times the, the question. My brother and I would be in the back seat of the car. We're driving home on a Sunday. And from the front seat was the question, what did you learn today? And I remember thinking to myself that at times I would think I would respond, it was a rerun. You know, a rerun, something that an episode on TV, we talk, to, talk about those being a rerun. The Bible story that day, because I had heard it before, it just seemed like a rerun. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have when we hear the scriptures and we hear a story. It, we're thinking we, we know the story from before, so it's, what are we going to get new out of this? But God's Holy Spirit steps in and can show us new things. And today, we're going to look at the parable of the prodigal son and this story, which seems very familiar, but yet there's more new things that we can be taught and can learn even from a rerun. So when the Bible story is announced, one of the typical things that people begin to do is they process in their heads what they know about the story, and then it kind of just sometimes stops there. And then our minds wander, and we, we tune in, and we tune out, and we don't mean to. It's just kind of how our minds operate. So let me give you an example. So if I said my message today was about Noah and the ark, instantly your mind is picturing two of every kind of animal going into an ark, and you're picturing a storm and a rainbow, all the details of the story. If I were to just talk about David and Goliath, you think about David, the young teenager who took a sling and killed Goliath, the giant, the Philistine giant, who no one else could even attempt to beat. And all the story and all the details that go around it is what you're processing. I think about Mary and Joseph and how we see the manger scene and we see baby Jesus and, and how that time of the year, that Christmas time, and all the things with the wise men and the shepherds, it all just kind of floods into our memories when we hear that that's going to be the message. And when we think about recently, Easter, and Jesus dying on the cross, and his resurrection, and how that story is something we've heard year after year, and, and we understand it, and we, we do our best to appreciate it. But it's when these stories come our way that we allow the Holy Spirit to speak new truth into our lives. And so today we're going to talk about the prodigal. In the prodigal, I want to take Webster's Dictionary and explain a little bit about the prodigal son. Because it would be really easy to think that the term prodigal kind of means lost or, or away or whatever it might be. But it's not always the case. So Webster says that the prodigal is a noun. One that, expand, one that expends money extravagantly or without necessity. One that is profuse or lavish, a waster, a spendthrift. I've heard the term spendthrift, but never really understood kind of what that means. But all of these elements of this definition are telling us it's someone who gives away wealth. So the story of the parable that we're going to see today also has another way it's been explained. The parable of the lost son. Now, so one side is looking at the financial change that happens and what he's done with his wealth. The other looks at more the spiritual side and losing his way. Being lost means different things to different people. So let me explain. When I was a young child, I'm told there was a day when something took place and all the circumstances around it. I was told that I was lost in a store and so somebody must have come along and realized that I was lost because they helped me find my way to the courtesy desk. I'm told that when they asked me my name, I said it was Gary Batman Gerstenberger. I'm told that they 
went over the loudspeaker and said, we would like the family of Gary to come to the courtesy desk and find him. I'm told that this was the way it worked. They don't have the memory of this, but it became the story of Gary got lost in Kmart. That's, that was the, the theme of that story. I don't remember being lost, but I obviously was. Someone must have come along and found me because I surely would have known to just to go to a courtesy desk. But in the process, not even realizing I was lost and not remembering that I was lost, I was lost. I was in a situation that I needed to be found. So as I think about that, and I think about the fact that being lost means different things to different people, I think about how years ago, before the day of cell phones and apps to know where you're going, how when you were driving to find some place, if you didn't know for sure where you were going and you were lost, it was culturally and traditionally a challenge for many men to take the time to go into a gas station or a store to ask for instructions. Now, personally, if I don't know where something is, I would rather go in anywhere than to be circling the block and not know where I'm going. But in the days of the apps of today, if you've got the address right, there's really no way you can be lost. It's going to tell you, and if you're going the wrong way, it says to basically to reroute. Lost, being lost. So we're looking at the parable of the lost son. Let's look at this text together today. Luke chapter 15, verses 31, I'm sorry, 15, 11 to 32. I'm going to read it. Follow along your Bibles if you would. So we're in a setting right now where Jesus has been sharing parables with a crowd. And each time he shares a parable, there's a different meaning behind it, trying to teach the people about the new way to serve God and what God was calling them to. So Jesus continued, is what it says. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring me the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine who is dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came to near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has come back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, 
all these years I've been slaving for you and you never and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours who was dead is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. What a great story. And if it's a story that you're familiar with or maybe it's brand new to you, whatever it might be, I want us to look at this story and look at a couple of things that help us to understand even more what God's love and God's care for us is due to this story, this prodigal story that Jesus is sharing with the people of his day so they would understand who the Heavenly Father was. To understand this story, we need to remember that the prodigal basically means a wasteful expenditure or a reckless spending. That's the kind of life that this son was living. So the prodigal son in this story wastes the inheritance foolishly. So what do we see in this story? First of all, we have a son who wants to be on his own, wants the inheritance, doesn't have any regard for the father, takes it and leaves. We have a loving father that even though he doesn't want him to go, he's given him free will and he's given him that opportunity to go. We have an older son who stays faithfully and works hard during this time. We have a father who also longs to know that even though he's given his son free will, he wants him to come home. We have a son who thinks he knows what he's doing like a lot of us at times, that he goes out and lives a life that is not what his father wants, but comes to the realization it's time to go home. We have a father who has been waiting all along, always with arms wide open. We have an older son who becomes angry. He stayed home and he worked and he did the things that he was supposed to do, but he was frustrated with what was taking place. Ultimately, we see a father's love. So it's interesting to think about what happens in those days. When you think about the, the culture of what was taking place in this whole setting, because this is not something that was a first-time thing. This happened in households. So Jesus is telling this parable because they understood the details that surrounded the culture. So as he's talking with them, the father basically talking to his son and explaining to him and walking through this process, we have a younger son that represents us, all of mankind. Jesus is trying to help the people understand that we are all the younger son. And we have a choice to accept God or to reject him. The Pharisees that were listening to Jesus and following him to see what he was saying, see if they could find and trip up one area that they could come and pounce. Those Pharisees that are listening represented the older son. They've faithfully gone through all the religious training, and they've done and followed all the rules, but yet they were empty. The inheritance that could be, could be given to a son could take place before a father passed away. So one of the things to understand is that the oldest son, and we've heard this before, the oldest son basically got the inheritance. Not true. The older son received two-thirds of the inheritance. The younger son received one-third. So this father, one-third of what he owned was basically cashed out and given to his son to be wasted. So when you think about that, to ask for that inheritance, it was disrespectful. It was like saying, don't really want to hang around until you die, so can I have my money? I can't imagine that kind of disrespect, but that's what was happening in this setting. But the father loved him so much, he gave him that one-third. So when the son returns, the significance of this is interesting. The things that are he, he's being given back in this process. First of all, he said, put a robe on him. The robe represented honor. He had honor in his father's house, even what he had done because he had come home. 
The ring represented authority. He wasn't just a servant like he went back to say he would be. There was authority that went with that ring. And he was given sandals. Sandals in that day was a sign of freedom. Slaves did not own sandals, only free men. Verse 20 says, so he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion for him, he ran to him and threw his arms around him and kissed him. God's love has that same kind of compassion for us. We are all born in sin because of the decision Adam and Eve made in the Garden of Eden. Because of that, we all, every one of us, are lost sons and daughters. Unless you've accepted Jesus Christ personally into your life and asked for forgiveness of sins, you are still a lost son or daughter. There are four different sons I want to talk about as I'm going to wrap this up here in just a few moments this morning. The first thing I want you to think about is the rebellious son. Here's the description. The rebellious son is someone who is running from God. They know who God is, and they still run from him. They know that they were created to have a relationship with God, but they still choose to reject God. They live life however they choose. They don't surrender their life totally to God because they're afraid of what that means and what they might have to give up. To the rebellious son, God the Father is waiting for you. And then there's the bitter son. The son who was bitter stayed away and worked. This son followed the rules, went to the synagogue, did all the things on the outside but not the inside to be the son of God. This person tried to live by their own strength and their own merit they don't always understand or give God everything in their lives. They think they have, but they're always holding something back. The bitter son, I want to say this to you today, God, the Father, is waiting on you. This is probably one of the saddest sons. This is the underprivileged son, the son who doesn't know anything about God and is totally lost. Someone whose life was, is being wasted and reckless in God's eyes. This is the person who doesn't understand that they were born in sin, that they need Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins and to let God reign over their lives. The reason they don't know is because no one has ever told the underprivileged son. They go through life confused, knowing that there must be more, but they don't understand the emptiness inside because no one has shown them. To the underprivileged son, God the Father is waiting for you. And then our last son of the four sons is the miserable son, the son who stayed but never celebrated or thought he had a reason to celebrate. This person loves the father, this person once understood a relationship, but it's gotten weak and maybe a little bit spiritually lazy. This person needs a desire in their heart once again, a fresh touch from God, because things aren't quite like they used to be. And the miserable son is frustrated in their spiritual walk. But the miserable son I have good news, God the Father is still waiting for you. Final thoughts of reflection. Today the Father is calling by his spirit, from his spirit to your spirit and my spirit. Lost sons and daughters come home. There is freedom in a relationship with the Father. On this Father's Day, if you're blessed and still have an earthly father, reach out to him. On this Father's Day, remember that your heavenly Father is constantly, through prevenient grace, reaching out to you. Embrace him, and all 
that he has for you, whether you understand it or not, he has fulfillment for your life. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I pray that the different types of sons that we might be hearing this message today will have the realization that the Holy Spirit, that you are wanting to draw them closer to you. Whatever stage they're in in their journey, you are calling them to be closer. We will never be side by side and just wait until eternity to be in your presence. We're constantly looking to draw closer to you. Help us to do that today, I pray, in your name. Amen. Have a great week.